Welcome to an enlightening podcast from IslamPodcasts.com. We encourage our listeners to please comment and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please remind your family and friends to also visit IslamPodcasts.com for engaging discussions on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran, Tafsir, Sira, and much more. Inshallah, I'm going to address a couple of things here during the session. Um, a bit of reflection on certain events that have happened in the least this week. A little historical uh, reflection on the past few decades, past few years, and then try and, and visualize or try and give a, a picture of what is to come, inshallah, in the future. And all this relates to the Muslim perspective, Muslim issues that are pertaining to today's times, and inshallah, what we may imagine will happen in, in the coming years, and how we as a Muslim community, we as a Muslim nation, as an Islamic nation, will inshallah have an effect um, on today's reality and, and the future outcomes of what happens in uh, this world. To begin with, recently we uh, probably all heard the news of Colin Powell's death, which happened this week. He was about 84 years old, and uh, it is said that he died due to the complications of COVID 19. Now, throughout the media coverage on, on his death, uh, you know, he is being uh, called, uh, you know, he is this glorious picture that is painted around who he was. You know, um, he's been hailed as a trailblazer. Terms like this, I mean, he was a patriot of man, of integrity, of honor, uh, of respect, of uh, multiple achievements throughout his career, uh, and so on and so forth. So, all of this nice praise has been uh, bestowed upon him. Uh, even to the point, one of the uh, one of his former colleagues, Richard Haas, he is the head of the Council for Foreign Relations, uh, who's worked with Powell over the past 30, 40 years. He goes on to further say that he was the important, the most intellectually honest person I ever met. Now, this is quite a bit of contrast in a whitewashing of this history. Uh, and why this is relevant enough, just bear with me for a second and connect these points, uh, is because there is a bit of irony here in his death. In 2003, uh, in February 2003, we all know this night. I saw it, and I saw the whole test, the whole conference, whole event, where he is addressed in the UN, where he picks up a, a small vial of anthrax, and he, he tells the United Nations and the whole world that there is weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, uh, and there is biological warfare. And, and the example that he presents is a small little vial of anthrax. And he says, uh, quote, my colleagues, every statement I made today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we are giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. Now, we all know this was an absolute lie, a complete lie, a complete fabrication to sell a war. To sell the, the, the Iraq war, to sell the so called war on terror. And millions upon millions of people have died throughout these past two decades. Thousands have been imprisoned, Muslims have been persecuted, uh, nations have been destroyed, and so on. Resources have been plundered, and the list goes on and on and on. So, this whitewash or painting of this. This Colin Powell as being a trailblazer, as being an honest man, is completely a false narrative. It is actually a lie. And we have to accept this fact, and then people have to know that we cannot just wipe off this 20 year history and, 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 and claim 
that you were some sort of benevolent person. Right? This person lied about it. And the irony is, while he is trying to prove to the world that there is a weapons of mass destruction of biological agents, for example, anthrax, the irony is that he is dead because of another biological agent, COVID 19, the virus. The link being is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, there is a, what you may call it, poetic justice, right? Poetic justice behind this. That this person who was also vaccinated against COVID and so forth, he gets killed by another biological agent. And now this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which the virus has had to have a problem across the world, especially in the Western world and so on and so forth. So, And it is this virus that, this biologically, this virus that has been perpetuated and the causes and the economic collapse and all the polit politics behind it, world leaders have used this to maintain their own political power, right? And to preserve, instead of preserving human life, they have, they have attained their political power. They've used it as a political tool to sit in power and so forth and progress and, and push their policies and what have you. This is the same thing that he did. Right. Uh, when he was questioned about his participation in the Iraq war and why he didn't stand up and he opposed the government, he says, quote, the more I think about it, the more I realize it's important to keep the job. You see that? I mean, blatantly, he says that I did all of this to keep my job. So no regrets in, in this person. Right. Now, this brings us to this point here the concept of re rejoicing. It is narrated in Surah Sahih Bukhari. There's this hadith that's reported by Abu Qatada bin Rabi al-Ansari. The hadith goes, a, a funeral possession passed by Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, relieved or relieving. The people asked, O oh Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is relieved and relieving? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a believer is relieved by death from the troubles and hardships of the world and leaves for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While the death of a wicked person relieves the people, the land, the trees, and the animals from him. The point being I'm trying to say is that it is good to rejoice on the death of a wicked person. There is shukr to be given. And this is what Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, is that when a person who, who, who is a tyrant, who is an oppressor, when he passes away, then the people are relieved by him. To the point that not just the people, the land, the trees, and even the animals are relieved by his oppression. And over the past few decades, what we have seen is, Alhamdulillah, some of these tyrants, some of these oppressors who have, uh, who have conjured up wars against innocent people and killed millions of Muslims across the world, imprisoned millions and so on and so forth, have slowly passed away. And there is rejoice for us in this. There is sugar for us in this. Whether it was McCain that died in 2018, a, a war criminal, I would say. Whether it's the Ronald Rumsfeld, another war criminal who died earlier this year uh, in June, now Colin Powell and so on. And I can give, give you a list of all these people who have perpetuated uh, an anti-Muslim, anti-Islam agenda. Whether it was Paul Wolfowitz, Dick Cheney, George Bush, Condoleezza Rice, Bill Crystal, um, Karl Rove, and all of these other people. They, they have done so much harm to the Ummah, it's unimaginable in these past 20 years. So their death... John McCain, Connelly, uh, or, or Ronald Rumsfeld, or Colin Powell, etc., is a moment for the Muslims to be happy about. There's another narration. Saad ibn Mansur reported in his sunan that Abu Bakr, radiallahu anh, he prostrated, and he made sujood out of joy and thankfulness when he heard the news that Musaylma al kadab was killed. When Musaylma was killed, Abu Bakr made sajda and gave shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another narration, it's mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, that Ali radiallahu went frustrated when he found out that Dhul, um, Dhul Thadiyah, he was one of the prominent figures in the Khawarij, had killed. So even Ali radiallahu 
he made sujood, he made shukr. Then when such and such, such and such person was killed. So this is part of our uh, deen. This is not something that's uh, undocumented, uh, that you can rejoice over the death of evil people. In another uh, book, this is, uh, this is the book of uh, Reliance of the Traveler. It's a Shafi Fiqh manual. Uh, in the, cha- the, the sub chapter of uh, prostration or sujood or shukr, right? To give shukr, or to, give, uh, to do such a, uh, for thanks. It says, quote, whenever a manifest blessing appears in one's life, such as the birth of a child, wealth or prestige, it is recommended to do sujood out of thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, when an affliction is averted, such as being saved from drowning, regaining health, or the reappearance of someone lost, or the death of a tyrant, that you do such the shukur, shukur, uh, such the shukur for it. Now that's today's reality. That's what I wanted to reflect on, is that slowly but surely, there are tyrants that are falling whether it is from the kuffar or whether it is from the Muslim, Muslim nations themselves, right? Muslim Mubarak, CC, etc. They, they will eventually, if they're not dead now, they will eventually fall and so forth. There is good in this. We have to look at it from that perspective. And why I say this, and this is to connect with the, the past that we have had over the past 20 years and the, the previous century. There are certain global trends that are taking place. And this is where um, I want to bring us back, bring us into the, the future, right? To reflect upon a certain global trends. And if you look at the past hundred years, the past hundred years, you've had so much conflict in this dunya. But in, in general, if you want to summarize the past hundred years, you can say that there are three major events that have happened in these past hundred years. Number one would be the rise of the American empire. Number two would be the fall of the colonial uh, um, empires, Britain, France, Germany, uh, Portugal, Spain, and so forth. Number three would be the rise and the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, all of the events that took place in the last hundred years, you can, you can put them under these three main global trends that occurred in the past hundred years. And everything else are the details that took place in World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, uh, the Cold War, uh, and, and so on and so forth. All of this will fall under these three major trends. And that's, that's how sometimes you have, when you look at history, you can look at history and you can kind of summarize certain major events that formed the past century. And these are those major trends, that the American empire became this global massive superpower Right, you had a, these old colonial empires, Britain, France, uh, Portugal, and Spain, and so forth. They all collapsed or, or, sh- or shrunk. They lost their colonies, whether it's in, in the Indian subcontinent, in Africa, and so on. And then you have a, the rise of a new way of life, a new system, a new ideology, which is communism. And then eventually, it falls in the late nineties, which which ends with the only superpower that exists in the late 90s. And America at that time reached its pinnacle of power. And that's why you see uh, the intellectuals at that time, like Francis Fukuyama said that this is the end of history, meaning that this is the end of what they assume to be the, the evolvement or the, the, the progression of mankind to, a, uh, to the best system possible, to the best, na- best uh, way of organizing human life, which is secular democracy, liberalism, and so forth. That was, the, that was the idea, right? That liberal ideas, secular ideas, the secular system uh, became the most dominant ideology of its time. The competing idea of communism and socialism collapsed. So there's nothing else for humankind to progress towards. And this is it. And hence, he said, this is the end of civilization, the uh, end of history, in, in other words. On the other hand, you have another political theorist called Samuel Huntington who comes along and he says, no, there is a new trend that's going to happen, which is the clash of civilizations. And he basically meant between the, the current Western world and the, the coming up Islamic world. And that's where his, his theory came along, the clash of civilizations. So within the 90s, you see that at its pinnacle of its empire, American empire, now the intellectuals and were thinking, what will happen in the next century? 
what is going to be the next trends? Where, do, where does the American empire go? Right? It, it had destroyed Iraq in 91, right? Uh, it, it showed its, its power, it's flexed its guns, uh, used nuclear weapons and so forth in, in, in the first Gulf War, right? Nobody to challenge the American empire. Now, once you reach your pinnacle of power, the only way forward is down. And, and this is where the, the intellectuals started to theorize, is that how do I, how do we as a nation preserve the American empire? And that's why within the 90s, you see all of these studies coming along with think tanks talking about preserving the American empire, whether it is Samuel Huntington, whether it's Francis Fukuyama, Fukuyama or whether it is the new conservative movement. Its founding uh, person was Leo Strauss, one of the professors in, uh, from the University of Chicago. His students included Paul Wolfowitz and, and so forth. That, that's where the new conservative movement comes in. Uh, Bill Kristol, uh, who formed the, um, uh, the project for the, the American century, right? Uh, him and others like him, like Paul Wolfowitz, et cetera, became part of the new administration. Uh, with the Obama administration coming, sorry, with the Bush administration coming in. So a quote from Leo Strauss, I think it makes it pretty clear to what this century came to be. And he says, Leo Strauss, the crisis of the West consists, uh, consists in the West having become uncertain of its purpose. His solution was a restoration of the vital ideas and faith that the past has sustained the moral purpose of the West. So the, what he's asserting here is that there is a certain crisis that he's imagining in the West. And how do you reass, reassert yourself? What is the purpose of this nation state? What is the purpose of this American empire now? Because it had fought the Soviet Union for the past uh, few decades. Now, who do we make the boogeyman? So now at the turn of the century, you see this philosophy of neoconservatism taking over the administration. And now there's a push to shove democracy down the throat of uh, Muslims, to shove liberal ideas, to shove uh, American visions of what it should be to, to live under secularism and so forth, right? And that's where you see the next 20 years coming. So if we look at the situation of the world right now, there are certain trends which are progressing Part of that is that there was this push to expand and preserve the American empire. The last century was about, was about building the American empire. So the new trend for the 21st century, number one, is about preserving that American empire. Preserving that, this uh, massive uh, indus military industrial complex, preserving maintaining your 800 military bases across the world, maintaining your political and economic and social and, and cultural dominance across the world. It is about that. So you see, you can fit everything that has happened over the 20 years is about America trying to preserve its might. And there has been a response. And this is, comes to my second point of the trends of this 21st century. There has been a response from the other nations. And this is what I would term is called the rise of the rest where Britain, France, uh, Germany, Russia, China, uh, um, uh, and to a certain extent, um, India, et cetera, they have, they have risen up to resist certain belligerence from the American empire. So on one hand, you have America trying to preserve its empire, and that is why you see a lot of conflict in the world. On the other hand, you have different nations who... who played along with America trying to resist or trying to elevate themselves to, to form a block or to, to preserve their, their own uh, piece of the cake and so forth. So there's something called the rise of the rest. And then the, the final issue, what we can see or what we can predict in the 21st century, and this is the, the rise of Islam, the rise of the Muslim nation. And this is where I'll, I'll, I'll try and focus my talk a little bit on. But I want to quote a couple of things here. In 2019, the Brookings Institute, one of the think tanks, it published a set of articles as part of a project it called the 1% the problem. 
Muslims in the West and the rise of the new populist. They looked at the, the, the thing, the 1% problem, that Muslims living in the West do not form a majority. They're probably 1% of the population in many of these Western nations, but they pose a problem to the very identity of these, Muslim, of these Western nations. This is from the Brookings Institute. The 1% problem, Muslims in the West and the rise of the new populist. Now, what they did is they focused on nine European countries and the United States. It examined the growth of the Muslim minority in those nations in those, and, and the fears around Islam's public role. Islam's public role in shaping and, uh, and, and forming this so-called populist uh, agenda, the populist uh, identities and ideologies in the Western democracies. The rise of populism in these in these many in, in these nations. So you see across the across the world, there is populist governments taking power. You have rise of nationalism. You have rise of protectionist policies. Um, and the United States, you know, it, it, it itself is suffering, right? In uh, because of the economic crisis in two thousand eight, the recent COVID nineteen crisis in two thousand nine, two thousand nineteen. Um, it's massive wars that it's fighting in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, which uh, uh, it basically lost, right? It, uh, from Afghanistan, definitely had a military defeat there. Um, massive military expenditures to maintain a certain uh, dominance over this region. You have problems at home with civil unrest. You have the Black Lives Matter movement. You have the, the, uh, the storming of the capital. You have rise of... Uh, uh, far right uh, nationalist groups. You have the rise of uh, uh, anti-immigrant sentiments, uh, whether it's against the the uh, uh, Latin American populations or whether it's against Muslims. Um, and then you have the rise of these populist leaders. Example being Obama. Uh, sorry, example being Trump um, or in in, in uh, Bolsonaro and all these other populist leaders that have risen in different parts of the world. And all of this shows that there is a, there is a movement towards populism and nationalism. There is, secondly, there is a decline in the American power, decline in the American influence that it has in, in political events, right? And then to this, it, it is competing factors. And there are other nations that are competing for control in the world, whether it's Britain, France, um, or whether it's Russia, and to a certain extent, the economic competition that China poses to the United States dominance. And all of this, the question of Islam and the question of Muslims is something that all of these nations have a problem with. And this is what the study says in 2019 that was published by the Brookings Institute. All of these nations, especially the European American nations, they have a problem with Islam. They have a problem with the Muslim populations that are living within themselves and outside in the Muslim world. You look at China, how it's persecuting the, Zing, the Muslims in the Xinjiang province, right? You see the Burma doing the same thing. You see France legislate, putting legislations against hijab and all of this stuff. Um, you see the uh, bans in, in Belgium uh, and even in Switzerland and so on and so forth. You can continue talking about this. And what we see here in the United States, where literally Muslims have been shot point blank for a quote-unquote a parking dispute. You guys remember uh, what happened a few years ago when three uh, young Muslim uh, two, uh, two sisters and her brother were killed, right? Literally point blank have, have been shot. So hate crimes have risen because at, at the end of the day, they have a problem with Islam and the Muslims, whether at home here or elsewhere. And, and one of the things, and, and this shows that what the study shows and the, what the report was showing that the question, they, they have an issue of what our nations are, who we are, these questions of identity, the questions of their own culture, of their own religion, and so forth. These are, these are questions that they are facing of what is America, what is Britain, what is France, what makes us who we are, and how is it that we can accommodate these people, these 1% problematic people within our countries, because they pose a threat, they pose a challenge to our way of life. Our way of life says freedom, secularism, remove the hijab, uh, show your body. Their ideology, their religion, their way of life tells them wear the hijab, obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, 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 uh, and these are diametrically opposite. So the Muslims are not accepting of secular values, secular freedoms, and, and so forth. So these cultural identity, identity, cultural issues, these identity issues, these issues of 
assimilation are a problem for Western nations. And this is where the, the, the third trend of this 21st century is towards, right? But to summarize, one is the, the, the America convulsing to, to preserve its empire. Number two is the, is the rise of other nations challenging the United States. And number three is the issue of, of, of the rise of Islam, the rise of Muslims. And this is where I think the, the, the Muslims have to think about taking this issue and realizing, look, this century can be the Muslim century, where we as an ummah present a, a diametrically opposing view of the dunya, of the world, that we have solutions for humanity. We don't need to go thousands of miles away to destroy nations and, uh, because they believe in a different religion. Right? We have solutions to economic problems, solutions to political problems, solutions to um, um, climate change and so forth. I mean, the amount of destruction, if you look at just the sheer amount of capitalism's destruction to the environment, it's mind boggling. I'm, I'm so that's why even the hadith goes, uh, going back to the hadith says, even the, the plants and animals are relieved when an oppressor passes away. So Islam does pose a, a, a challenge to the world. Islam does pose a challenge to what uh, the current system is, challenge to American imperialism, challenge to Western inter- interference in Muslim countries and so forth. It poses a challenge to secular ideas. It poses a challenge to the ideas of freedom. It poses a challenge to capitalism and so forth. Right? And this is where we as an ummah have to really think about how do we take the ideas of Islam and, and make it practical in the lives of the people, whether it's for the Muslims or the non-Muslims? It's not just about the issues of ibadat or, or, or issues of rituals and so forth. It is about a political project. It is about a project where Islam is implemented on a full-scale level. It's the part of the infrastructure of the, of the nation. It is part of the state a- apparatus. It is where the Sharia is implemented. It is where your gold and silver are used as currency rather than fiat currency. It is where the economic model actually helps cultivate people in a way that they preserve their Islamic identity. It is where land is utilized to cultivate resources so that people can be taken away from, uh, taken out of poverty and given and be make and made land landowners, right? It is about taking control of the hoarding issues that take place in the world. It is about control of your economic resources so that it can benefit the people rather than benefit certain major corporations. Um, you know, gas prices are four dollars uh, to the gallon currently, right? In Islam, the Islamic model says that look, gas is is public property. No major corporation is going to control and fluctuate and, and play with the futures market and control the prices. Right? This is a necessity for the people. So a state will manage that. There, there's multiple examples we can give. And the, the best example, I, I would say, is that, look, the West, the Western nations have failed. They have failed to bring people together. That's why they have to come up uh, in like this Brookings Institute report that the problem of the one percent they're unable they're unable to to uh, to deal with the Muslim what they call the Muslim problem literally that's what they call that the, quote unquote of the Muslim problem how do I deal with the Muslim problem Islam on the other hand does not look at people as a problem we look at hum- people as human beings that need to be taken care of. The Islamic Khilafah, the Islamic State, looks at human beings, whether the Muslims or their kafir, it doesn't matter. It is to take care of their needs, take care of their, uh, their requirements, to help bring, build a harmonious society, a society where you are not in conflict with one another. It's, it's been 200-something years of the United States, but still you have racial tensions in this country. It doesn't go away. It... it, uh, it, it it raises his ugly head every now and then, right? Racial tensions, when we talk about white supremacy, this is like the Jim Crow laws and all of that stuff. It is unable to bring people together, even by force of law. On the other hand, the Muslim history, Muslim, you don't see this. You don't see uh, major conflicts among people where people who were Christians and Jews and so forth lived under the Islamic state for centuries without 
having suffer, having to suffer these so-called these these massacres or, or or they were mistreated and so on and so forth. You know the the, the Egyptian Coptics they they have lived in Egypt for centuries. Same thing with the Jews that used to live in in Palestine and in, in, in Asham. They've lived there for centuries. Same thing when we we took care of the Jewish people that were being uh, persecuted by the Spanish Inquisition and 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 they lived in Morocco for decades, and so on and so forth. So we don't have this. The people were brought together. We didn't consider people to be a problem. It is it is the it is the nature of Islam that it tells us that you need to take care of people, whether they're Muslim or not. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith, he says, anyone who harms a dhimmi is as if he harmed me. Right? So anybody who harms a non-Muslim, a non-Muslim citizen of the state, and so forth. So this is where we as Muslims have to really think about that. Look, inshallah, there is a trend. Inshallah, there is a way that I, I can, and of course, we can have a discussion afterwards, that there is a positive trajectory. And, and, I, do, and I always look at things from a, a positive perspective. That regardless of what we have seen in the past 20 years of massive destruction of the world, including Muslim and non-Muslim, alhamdulillah, I see a positive light in all of this. I see a positive trajectory for the ummah. Because it is where, you, if you look at the trends across the Muslim world, People are coming back to Islam. They are reconnecting with the deen. They are becoming more religious. They are questioning Western liberal ideas. There is a rejection of uh, a rejection and a push uh, uh, that has been over the past 20 years to push uh, and infiltrate Western ideas and secular liberal ideas in the Muslim lands. And, but there is a rejection of this. There is a push back, right? Um, I think some of my elder, my, my uh, senior uh, senior people in the audience may remember. If you go back to Egypt or, or Lebanon and so forth in these countries, you would see women walking the streets in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, even in miniskirts. Right? You don't see that as often anymore. You see, there's a difference. There, there is a, there is a ruju towards Islam, whether here in the West or whether somewhere else. There's a reconnection of your identity as, as, as Muslims. Now the, the, the project is to take this and, and apply it on a state level where the ummah is ruled by the rules of Islam, where it is, it is rejecting secular liberal democracy and so forth and implementing the sharia of Islam. And, and what better system can there be? What better system can there be other than the deen of Islam? Because it is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who else is the best to give you a, a system by which to rule the world? We have seen its effects over the past 1300 years, whether it was the Umayyads, Abbasis, the Uthmani Khilafa, and so on and so forth. There is, by, just by your aqidah, just by the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no other system that could be more beneficial than any other system that human beings can create. Because ultimately, it is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else. It is just by its very definition. The application is needed. And that's where the project should move. And, 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 and I think it is where the ummah is, is asking these questions. What is the role of Islam in public life? What is the role of Islam in politics? What is the role of, uh, of the, the khilafa and, 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 and talking about its history and, and, and talking about its future and so forth? These are the discussions that are going on. And alhamdulillah, this is good. And this is beneficial. And this is where I believe the trajectory is. And it is a positive light. At the end, this is where I'll end with, and inshallah, we can open the floor for discussions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Nafal, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُوا بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and remember, O Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Prophet, when the disbelievers, when the kuffar, they conspired against you, when they held you captive, when they killed you, and when they exiled you. They planned, but Allah also planned. And Allah is the best of planners. Surah Al-Anfal, ayah number 30. And think about this. Muslims across the world have been imprisoned, captured, 
they have uh, they have been killed they have been exiled from their homes there's massive refugee crisis in Syria in Burma in, in Kashmir in Palestine um, in the Xinjiang province everywhere you go they have their mass incarceration of the Muslims in China for example over a million people have been incarcerated and they are uh, they are um, reprogrammed in these in these camps to lose their identity as a, uh, as a Muslim forcefully married to a kafir, uh, taking the Quran away. I mean, the amount of oppression that there is, is unimaginable. Look at what's happening in India, right? Uh, uh, lynching of Muslims, literally lynching of Muslims in day broad, broad daylight and they don't, it, nobody cares. The police doesn't persecute these people. You take what's happening in Burma, Babies being killed, massacred, raped, so on and so forth. Syria, massive refugee crisis. Babies, uh, populations killed off in battle bombs. Massive people are trying to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan and, 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 and Syria, trying to make their way across the world in, in little shanty boats, dying on the seas trying to make it to the European countries so that they can have some respite from the oppression. The irony again here is that these are the very nations that have massacred you, but we are seeking refuge in those very nations, right? Think about it, going to these European countries. That, that, that is the, the paradox of the Ummah, unfortunately. And in this moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he takes away some of these oppressors. So alhamdulillah, say alhamdulillah when these people die. Say alhamdulillah when these people die. Rejoice, laugh about it, smile about it, because their judgment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be much severe. They're not, they're not, they won't be let go by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will be persecuted, inshallah. At the end of the day, of course, Allah can forgive whoever he wants, but we know from what is obvious. Someone dies a kafir, we know what happens to him or her. So it is good to rejoice in these matters. And it is, it is to take it into a positive light. A virus killed a vaccinated tyrant. He tried to sell, he sold a war against innocent people using a biological agent called anthrax as an example. There is irony in this. Nimrud was killed by a fly by, Allah subha- by, the, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, that Allah is the best of planners, regardless of how much they want to spend to subdue Islam and to eradicate its power and eradicate it from public life, Allah's plans will succeed. The question is, where do we fall in those plans? Where are we on that path? Where are we on this Sirat al-Mustaqim? Are we on the sidelines just watching and, 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 and not participating? Or are we in that Sirat al-Mustaqim? Are we in those plans being a tool to fulfill the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Wa da'wana. And alhamdulillah. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Podcasts on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran, Tafsir, and Sirah are available at islampodcasts.com as well as on iTunes. Rate, review, and comment and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about islampodcasts.com.